everybody, Noma Langa Mthali Moses here with themochamoguls.com. I'm here with our personal finance expert, Dr. John Beckham. How are you doing today, JB? I'm doing excellent. How are you doing today, Noma? I'm doing great. Um, so I, I did a, a video recently, I did a segment that was talking about a hot topic, which was Tamar Braxton and her husband, music producer and executive, Vince Herbert, they're getting a divorce. But I thought that it would be interesting to bring you into the conversation because I talked about the, the whole incident with regards to family, marriage, and so forth, and uh, wealth building. But I thought it was important to bring in a personal finance expert because I saw so many issues that were related to money and personal finances, right? Oh, so here are the, the, thing, the, the summary of it. Uh, TMZ reported that Tamar lost her job, which I already knew. Um, at the reel, and this was earlier in the year, so maybe around April, May, she was fired from the reel. Um, so again, a loss to their personal finance, um, to their income. Okay, um, and um, they also reported that this uh, impacted her very much, where she was depressed and wasn't doing very much. And mind you, she's a, a working singer, songwriter, whatever. Um, and then. Um, just recently, we found out that her husband, Vince, was being sued by Sony for close to $4 million. And again, then recently, we also found out that Sony won, so now he owes Sony a lot of money. Um, and then again, recently, we also found out that um, Tamar filed for divorce, and this is earlier this week. After last month, just a month ago, she said that she was leaving the music industry because she felt that it was negatively affecting her marriage and her family. So she was leaving it so she could focus on her family. Um, and then um, now she's leaving the marriage that she left the music industry for. Um, and one other thing to note is that uh, Tamar, as a, a singer songwriter and a very successful one, mind you, and lucrative business that she had, um, her husband was her producer and her manager. So in other words, he was her client. So when she stops working, some of his money also stops. Um, so from a personal finance expert's point of view, uh, what are your, what's your initial thought about this? So this is the first I'm hearing of this. You know, I have no idea who Tamar Braxton is other than I recognize the name Braxton. So I'm assuming that she's the sister of Tony Braxton. Yes. Um, again, you know, I'm not a fan of the Braxtons. I don't follow them. And I, I definitely don't know um, who, who her husband is. But just based on the, the information that you have, uh, you know, shared with me, uh, I can give you, you know, what, what I think about it financially. So um, it's not surprising that this relationship is ending in divorce. In divorce. Uh, if you kind of follow your sequence of events, you know, losing a job, being sued, uh, $4 million, um, you can see where the money is starting to dry up. And so a person is kind of like, hey, no money, I'm out. Um, the number one cause for divorce is money. Um, it's, it's money problems, it's, it's financial arguments. It's the number one uh, cause for divorce worldwide, not just in America. Um, so, you know, the, this is not uncommon um, to even pe people who are not celebrities. So if you kind of follow this. Um, and if anyone kind of tune in to my teachings or my videos or the blogs, um, you'll find out that I, I am very um, adamant about people putting away emergency fund. So while you're working and you still have a job and get an income, um, start to put away what I call an emergency fund, which is, a, and, and in my opinion, emergency fund should be eight months of your gross salary. So you're slowly putting this away to build up this fund and, and it's liquid. So I'm not putting it in the stock market. I'm not uh, <clears throat> putting it in, a, in some real estate or asset, anything like that. I'm probably gonna put it in a money market uh, account where I'm getting more than just a regular interest from a savings account. I'm gonna try to get you know 1% or more, but I have a checkbook that I can write checks on it. I have a, a debit card where I can go to ATM or I can just do an electronic withdrawal and I have my money. Why do I say this emergency fund is important? For such a cause as this Tamar Braxton, um, if you look at a lot of the financial uh, pundits out there will always say six months of expenses, I think more. Because if you look at the 2008, 9, 10, and so forth, unemployment for those individuals who are unemployed, 
lasted longer than six months. Uh, sometimes it was lasting nine months, a year, 15 months, two years. So having eight months of your gross salary gives you kind of a safety net to try to hurry up and reduce expenses as well as try to, to secure another job. Uh, also looking at the situation uh, of her husband being sued for $4 million and now have to come up with $4 million. If a person is, is living at or above um, um, their income, right? Um, then, then they're not gonna have any extra money because as soon as the money comes in, they're spending it. You know, I always wondered, uh, how does a person who, who getting paid $20 million a year after they leave, let's say, a professional sport, you know, NFL, NBA, whatever, uh, they gotta file for bankruptcy. Why? It's because they're spending all the money they, as fast as it's coming in, is going out. Um, they're not thinking about uh, later on in life or if, if their income is reduced. So number one, you don't want to live at or above your means, um, especially if you just have what is called ordinary income. Ordinary income is just income that you get from an employer. Somebody else pays you for your time. You give them time of nine to five, they give you a check for what they think your time is worth. Um, that is ordinary income, which pays the most taxes, by the way, but that's another video. So uh, another thing that any family can do, um, any blue collar, uh, middle class, lower class, upper class, doesn't really matter. If you're working for an employer and you do have a nine to five, um, take that money, which we call fiat, take that money and, and try to now not only pay your expenses, but secure assets passive income, things that's going to pay you whether you go to work or not go to work. You know, so if in their case, if they're in the music industry, which seems like it was, um, then they could have bought, they could have bought land, they could have bought real estate, they could have bought uh, equity stock, um, they could have bought some other paper assets, you know, they could have had some royalties. In other words, if they lose this high income, you know, from the music, from performing, they still got other avenues to give them passive income where it could sustain them until they found the next gig or next job. And, and that's a warning to all income levels, not just these celebrities. Lastly, because you talked about three things, you talked about her losing her job, which I talked about the emergency fund. You talk about the lawsuit, which I talk about having multiple streams of income or revenue, and hopefully some of it is passive. Uh, and by the way, let me explain what I mean by passive. Passive is no matter whether you go to work or not go to work, whether you live in um, uh, Botswana, but now you're also in New York, no matter where you go, every single month, somebody is depositing money into your account. That's passive. You're not actively working for it. Maybe you've already done the work and now you're just reaping in the benefits. Mm -hmm. So if you can think of, of royalties as an example of that, like somebody made a song 20 years ago but every time somebody plays it they're getting income or if you can think about you bought a stock you bought the stock at a hundred dollars and it's a dividend paying stock so every quarter they give you so much dividends per share or if you think about real estate if you think about a commercial property or apartment buildings someone's living there every month they pay you rent you take out a portion of that you pay your bills or whatever left over you have that's passive income but the third thing that you talked about was um, now Tamar Braxton has filed for divorce. Um, we did a video and I, and I highly recommend everybody go in and, and, and visit the video. It talks about the money conversations that you should have before you say I do. Um, to me, it does not appear based upon what you told, because I know absolutely nothing about these people, that they had a financial plan prior to getting married. Um, those are conversations that you want to have understanding um, what type of debts a person have, the type of credit, their philosophy in regards to money, whether they save or investment or invest, um, their, their children, how they plan on teaching their children about money, retirement, what are their goals, aspirations, ideal regard to retirement, and succession planning, what are they going to pass on. Um, if a person had these conversations, then you can automatically be able to discern whether or not they're marrying you for your money or marrying you because their standard of living is going to increase based upon the money that the, that the marriage have and whether or not they are the type of person who can have conversations about money um, and come to a resolution when things changes. So uh, it shouldn't 
marriage traditionally is not uh, for better or for worse financially. <laughs> it's better or worse holistically. Right. Um, and that worse in their situation right now is in regards to the money situation. So to recap, you know, you should have an emergency fund, plan for emergencies. Number two, um, you should have multiple streams of income, passive income, always reducing your expenses or liabilities and try to, and, and try to grow and, and, and um, uh, obtain assets. And then number three, um, having heart-to-heart -heart financial uh, conversations with your spouse or significant others and, and having that conversation dynamic, you know, where you might come back and revisit this conversation yearly or, or biannually or every three years and, and actually write it down. Hey, this is our plan. We put in this percentage away for uh, the household. We put in this percentage away for retirement. We put in this percentage away for our, our, our children's uh, college fund. We put in this percentage away for investments or, or, or passive income and understanding that, you know, things might change and we come back and, and visit this. Or you might say, hey, um, as a man, I'm responsible for this, X, Y, and Z. Um, you're responsible for that. Or the role might be reversed based upon who's bringing in more income you know if, if, if one spouse makes a substantially more money than the other spouse then the responsibilities should should change but understanding that we started off having conversations about money being totally honest up front and most importantly finding um, solutions and actually putting it in writing and say hey I agree to this you agree to that hey sign it if you have to no not making it a legal document, but making it a stakeholder between you and your significant other that we both in agreement to collaboratively, this is what we're going to do financially. Right. And you know what I know about um, married couples is sometimes when there's a, a stress in the marriage um, or disagreement, um, prior agreements that were made suddenly become very fuzzy. So it really does help to have that reference point of, hey, this is what we wrote down. Remember, this is what I said. Remember, that's what you said. Um, it, it, it helps. Um, and I wanted to add one more thing that you said, but you didn't necessarily call it a point was, and I think it's very important to highlight as well, is that you said people should not live, number one, not beyond their means, certainly, but should not live to at a point where everything they get um, mm -hmm. they spend. So you're basically spending everything that you have, which right. then... Um, will make the other point moot where you're supposed to uh, uh, start building investments, passive income, getting real estate, whatever it is. You can't really do that when everything that comes in is spent. So I think that's very really important. Um, and, and also, you know, uh, people need to be able to um, maintain their independence uh, somewhat, um, even when they're married. And what do I mean by that? Um, so different things work for different couples. Some couples pool all of their money together in one account, you know, so everything that one spouse has or significant other and everything that the other person has, they just put it together and they spend out. For some people that work, for others they don't. You know, it, it might be a case where I know some couple says, okay, um, I'm putting uh, 80, 85%, 90% into this joint account, we're both doing it, but also got this separate account that I'm gonna put things, 10% uh, of my income or anything extra I want in that for whatever I wanna do. Maybe I wanna surprise you on your birthday or anniversary, or maybe I wanna go out and hang out with the fellas or the girls or be able to do X, Y, and Z and not take away from the income that's supposed to be for the family. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, they, they keep this level of independence um, as though they marry, even though the bulk of it might be going into a joint account. And then some couples say, hey, you know, just let me know what I'm responsible for. It'll get done, but I'm keeping it all my, you know, money and account separately. Um, but having these conversations will uh, would, uh, hopefully uh, eliminate getting to the point where th these couples have gotten to. Now that their finances are, are in trouble, now their resolution is divorce. So no matter what avenue you choose, as long as you have these open conversations and you both agree to it, make it work. Right. And I like the fact that you pointed out that it doesn't have to be um, celebrities only. Because, um, again, one of the things that I've learned through the conversations and the segments that we've done about personal finances is um, actually it really sometimes isn't about the money or the information that you have. It's about your habits. So really your habits, whether you're making 
a hundred thousand, fifty thousand, or you're making the millions that they were making. It really doesn't matter the income level. The most important thing is the habits. So just like you said, um, you know, you put away six months, and, and actually you recommend eight months of an emergency fund or your expenses, whatever it is. If your expenses are, you know, a normal. Um, Middle class family, your expenses are going to be maybe a couple thousand, maybe four or five thousand a month, whatever it is. Um, and if you're a celebrity, it's a couple of million a month, whatever it is. Um, you still have to apply that same discipline of saying, okay, this is how much I'm spending, be clear about it, and this is what I'm doing consistently. So, in order to be able to plan and be wise, let me take this, multiply it by eight, and, and build that up. So, it's really not about the money, or at least the amount of money, it's about the habit of of uh, practicing these disciplines, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the amount of money is not the important part. You know, I always say money only magnifies things. If, if you guys have, if the couple in question doesn't, does not have a financial plan, Larger amounts, it's always the, the behavior, the habits, the thoughts um, in regards to money itself. So uh, great information here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beckham. I uh, just want to remind everybody where they can find you. Um, you can find Dr. Beckham's blog at personalfinanceblueprint.com. You can also visit him at drjohnbeckham.com. You can also go to the Personal Finance Institute it's at a teachable site called Life After Debt. So Life After Debt um, is a place where you can find, um, you're going to find courses, which are a lot of them are in development. You're going to find free information, video segments such as these. Um, and then also going forward, uh, that's where we'll be hosting, or at least Dr. Beckham will be hosting personal finance um, webinars, uh, seminars, courses like that. So again, that's uh, Life After Debt um, at Teachable, and it's the Personal Finance Institute. And you can find Dr. Beckham at drjohnbeckham.com. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Beckham. Always very, very enlightening uh, talking to you. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure. You guys have a great day. Thank you guys. Have a good one.